Welcome back to COGX 2021. I'm Christine Foster, CCO at the Alan Turing Institute, and we're the UK's Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. There's so much happening across the festival, so I'll mention two of the Turing events. First, Vanessa Lawrence, who's on the board of the Turing, will join a panel about reinventing the high street with geospatial and place-based innovation. That's going to be on Wednesday at noon on the Planet and Smart Cities stage. Also, Andrea Baroncelli, the theme lead for economic data science at the Turing, will be discussing NFTs, non-fungible tokens, and the future of digital art. That's tomorrow on the Createx stage at 1 p.m. We're going to be starting the session in a moment, and so I'd encourage you to submit questions throughout the session because we'll be doing some Q&A at the very end. This next session is a fascinating one. It's about bats. So let me introduce the expert speakers. We have Alex Turpin. He's a scientist and an entrepreneur. He's an expert in deep tech, including photonics, computer vision, and artificial intelligence. We have Daniele Faccio, who's a professor in quantum technologies. His research focuses on the physics of light, how we harness light to answer fundamental questions, and how we harness light to improve society. Welcome. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, thank you. Hi, everyone. So, Alex, tell us about bats. What do you mean when you say to be like a bat? And to be like a bat must be a, a very fascinating thing, to be honest. And, and in this respect, we, we consider how bats navigate and, and go through the world, especially during night, right? So we have heard about all this eco-location sensitivity that, that bats have. And the way this works is that bats emit high-pitched sounds and they wait and listen to the echo. So what they basically do is that they emit vocalizations, like we basically talk, very similar. They do it at the very high frequency range, something that is over the audible region of our ears. And they do very different things with these vocalizations. First, uh, they have like a, like a stopwatch in their brain that, tell, that tells them how long does it take to these vocalizations to go back since the moment they emit it. And with this, they can sort of tell where or how far uh, a moth or a, or a possible prey is in distance. They are also able to tell if the echoes that are reflected back from this prey are coming fast from the left or from the right ear. And also because of the shape of their ears, they can also tell if this prey is up or down. And additionally, they are also able to tell uh, that if the vocalizations that they are sending, this frequency, right, this noise changes in terms of, of frequency, they can tell if this moth or this little prey is coming towards them or moving far away from them. So basically, by just sending these vocalizations, they can tell, even at night, in the presence, without the presence of any bite, they can tell how far an object is, where it is coming from, and the speed that they are having. And additionally, they are also able to tell more or less the shape of this uh, little animal or, or, or all this object, right? Uh, and this is fascinating because by just emitting noises and hearing to the, to the echoes that are coming back from their own noises, they can tell many, many things from, the, uh, from their environment. And they do this with a very high precision. It's, it's amazing, but their brain is even able to tell them with a precision and a resolution of about 400 nanoseconds, this is 400 uh, parts over a million, uh, the depth that this prey is moving. So they are able to tell within less than a millimeter how far uh, uh, one of these moths or little insects are. So bats are really fascinating. They, they are really able to use their own body and their senses to just navigate. And, and they probably do it with much more precision than we can do with our, with our own eyes. So tell me about your work and this tech that you're building. How, how does it work? So coming back to bats, and we, we were inspired by them, what we do is that we are also are using echoes, echoes of waves. In our case, we can use waves that are also acoustic waves. They can be radio frequency waves and even potentially optical waves. But they, we do prefer to use 
radio frequency waves, like the similar to that we use in our cell phones that we have in our Wi-Fi at home. And we do a very similar things that what bats do. We also emit bursts of these waves, okay? And we also have a sort of a sensor that waits to hear the echoes of these, of these waves. Uh, what bats do that is different to what we do is that they only use the first echo that comes from the prey. So they send their, their waves and they wait, they wait for these waves to come back to them. In our case, we do something a little bit more complex. What we do is that we use what we call as multipath echoes. Picture yourself in a, in a mountain, you know, in a valley full of mountains, right? If you just shout hello or, or the typical echo, you will hear your own voice coming back if it's been reflected in one of the mountains. But if there are more mountains that are a bit farther away, you will hear a second echo, right? So this is one uh, more echo. And then if you hear and there's another mountain farther, you will hear a third echo. And if you picture this information in your mind, how this is looking like, it's basically like a time trace that is telling you the amount of power in terms of waves that is arriving per instant of time. Now, imagine that you take uh, this plot that we call a histogram and we make it a bit more complex. Imagine now that you're in a room and this room is it's big by, by walls and there is an object. There is, for instance, a human walking in this room and you have this sensor and this antenna or this emitter that is able to emit waves. And these waves can now bounce not only once, but many times within the room. For instance, the waves can go to the, to the person, from the person, they can be reflected to the ceiling, then to the ceiling to the floor, to, and from the floor to the sensor. And we can do this many, many times. We can send these bursts, and we can allow them to propagate within the room. The nice thing of, of this approach is that now we are also able to gather information from the viewpoint that is behind the person, not only what is direct light in direct line of sight with respect to us, right? I don't know if you, if you hear about these um, uh, pieces of art from Yayoi Kusama, who has all these infinite mirror rooms. So this would be very similar to having an infinite mirror room, a room that is made by, by walls that are mirrored. And if you think that, what you would see is just basically, you would see yourself if you are inside the room from all the possible perspectives. And this is basically what we are doing with, with our with our algorithm. We are sending waves, we are allowing these waves to propagate within the room, to reflect and interact with all the objects in all the different viewpoints. And we also record the arrival time of these waves per instant of, of time. And as you can imagine, this is an extremely complex type of data. And we as humans, we, we are not able to work with, with this data because it's basically un uncomprehensible for us. There are no patterns obvious in this data. And this is the reason why we decided to use an artificial intelligence algorithm. This algorithm is now able to interpret this data. It's able to understand what is behind all these many, many uh, peaks that we have in our signal, and is able to transform this signal into a 3D image. It's able to transform just one of these multipath echoes into uh, an estimate of the image, or sorry, of the scene in three dimensions. And this is basically how our, our system works. We are, we are influenced and we are inspired by bats, but it's a little bit more complex. And thanks to artificial intelligence, we can now provide images just from one of these echoes. That's cool. I loved your imagery of the uh, uh, sort of hall of mirrors, the Kusama work. Um, it's very interesting. Um, so Daniele, maybe you can talk a little bit about the sort of inspiration beyond the bats, right? So sort of what prompted you to head into this area and why you do this kind of work? Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks for the question. So, um, I mean, we didn't originally set out thinking uh, about bats. Uh, I mean, everything started, I'd say, several years ago when we were looking at a related but uh, quite a different problem. And the problem we were looking at was to try and see if we could, we could image behind corners or image create images of a scene that's unfolding itself behind a wall. Um, there are many reasons for doing this. There, 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 there are many applications um, for doing this. 
think, for example, if, if I could see behind a corner and I could mount this device on a car, then you could have some very advanced collision avoidance, for example, or in a certain sense, your car would be able uh, to see into the future and be able to tell you what's happening behind the corner if there are other, other vehicles uh, approaching. But of course, I mean, one can think of many, many other applications. Now, this problem is, is related to sort of the bat sensing that Alex has been talking about, because here too, the, the way this is done is, I mean, originally we, we were working with lasers, with, with laser beams. So you sh the idea is that you shine the laser beam onto the floor or a ceiling or, or, or you know, some surface which would then reflect the light into, you know, through the through an open door, for example, or through a window, into the room where your 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 vision is blocked by a wall. This light would then interact with the environment. It would bounce back and then hit the same wall or or, or door again, and then be reflect, reflected back to you. So this is an example again of what we would call multi-path imaging, because I I sent the light out to the wall. It's hit the wall. It's gone inside your room interacted with some objects, it's bounced back again, and then has been reflected back to me. So that's like th that's three path uh, imaging, if you want. And, um, and you know, the many groups around the world have been uh, working on this. There's some amazing results also from, uh, from the, U the, the US. So it turns out you can actually do full 3D imaging of, uh, of a room by doing this, what we call non-line of sight uh, sensing or imaging. And, and one of the key technologies to doing this is to use this very precise timing information. Uh, and this, well, Alex was talking about this 400 nanoseconds, this 400 parts in a million sensitivity that bats have. And with lasers, we, we, we can do much better, uh, much better than that. We can have sensitivity of one part in a trillion. But essentially, it's this very um, sort of exquisite temporal detail and information that we can get from the return signals that allow us to image behind a wall or, or inside a closed a closed room. And so that got us thinking, um, you know, what else can we do uh, with this with this kind of technology? And we were looking a little bit at some of the problems that you have with a laser. So when you're shining light on a wall, I mean, the, the wall behind me here looks opaque. It certainly is not a mirror. And the reason for this is because you've got some surface roughness and scattering. So the light hits the wall and it sort of diffuses and scatters when it comes back. It's scattered into all, all directions. It, it's kind of the same reason why when you look at snow, it's white and you can't see through the snow. It, it's not absorbing the light. It's just scattering it in all different directions. And it, it's just confusing all, all the information and scrambling things up. And so you end up a bit like also clouds uh, behave the same way. You end up with this sort of like white fluff instead of an actual image. So you can't see through snow, you can't image through a cloud. And likewise, I can't use reflection from the wall behind me to uh, as if it were a mirror to see to see things. However, if you change the wavelength of your, uh, of your illumination, and so you go to much longer wavelengths, and this comes back to the radar that, that Alex was talking about, radar wavelengths, you know, the, or the wavelengths in your microwave are essentially just forms of light, but with a longer wavelength. These no longer see the surface roughness on the wall, and the wall starts to behave like a mirror. And this is a great advantage. Now, we don't have cameras that can see that you know that, that that work work for radio waves, but we now have these radio waves that are bouncing off of all the surfaces as if these were mirrors, and that's highly much more efficient than um, than bouncing off a diffusing uh, diffusing wall, as happens with the light you know, reflecting off of the wall behind me. And so that then got us thinking. You know, we started playing around with the technology. We started noticing that when we just look at the return signal, we can now really, because we've removed all this diffusive scattering, we could now very precisely see in the in the in the, the temporal echoes. We could see all of these reflections, and you get peaks, and you can actually count them. Uh, and we can see all these echoes coming back from the multiple reflections. And so then, then we started looking at this in more detail. Um, information theory analysis and all these complicated things. But long story short, we, re we suddenly realized that there was a huge amount of information in all these multiple paths. And that led us to developing the technology that uh, Alex was talking about a moment ago. 
On a personal note, did you get teased by your colleagues, switching from the physics of light to radio waves? Uh, yeah, a, a little bit, yes. Uh, and, and we're even going to ultrasonics now and using sound, so yeah. <laughs> okay. um, but in all seriousness, um, I'm hoping that the audience will have um, been thinking their questions and we'll uh, get to them later. So I'll take um, the privilege of moderating and ask one more which is really about um, application. So um, there's all sorts of mischief with being able to see through a wall. Um, but um, in all seriousness, what do you hope this technology can do and for whom? So, yeah, I think this is one of the most exciting aspects of this. And, and it's sort of following up the what I was saying a moment ago about how one thing leads to another. And I think that this, more of that is happening again now. So it's it's yes, the technology itself is exciting, but it's also the ramifications and different ideas that then this then sets in motion, which I think is is equally exciting. So we we have developed and tested this technology so far in in rooms of closed environments. So if we take a closer look at that, you know, where, where can that lead us? So at the moment, um, so just to give you some statistics, in 2018, more than 7% of the US population required an overnight hospital stay. Um, and by 2050, the, the world's population aged 65 years or older is going to increase from 700 million that we have today to 1.5 billion. And so what that is telling you is that we're heading for, for a problem when it comes to hospitalizations and, and, and taking care of, uh, of an aging population. And the, the thinking here is that the, the, the way we uh, track and monitor our health is going to have to move more away, away from hospitals and more towards the, the the setting in which we live, so our homes, and the the idea is that homes will become intelligent. I mean, we, we've already seen some signs of this, you know, intelligent fridges that, that can order food for you. Uh, but what I'm talking about here is healthcare. It, it, it's a it's an intelligent ambient that will uh, follow what you're doing, uh, will track your health. It's not about tracking you and what you're doing, but it's about tracking your your vital signs. And the interesting thing is that you know, there, there is a whole series, especially mental um, age, you know, neurodegeneration problems, uh, where there's evidence that these can be caught at a very early stage. Just for example, by tracking uh, uh, the way you move, how many times you move a day, but also what we call the micro movement, so how you're moving. So very subtle changes that you you cannot pick up because they happen very slowly uh, over time. You don't notice they're happening, but they are the result, for example, of neurodegeneration. And if picked up in time, uh, can uh, lead to sort of effective cure or at least uh, slowdown of of uh, of disease progression. Now this is just one example. Uh, we have been um, coming back to this idea of. So, you know, what, what, what kind of ramifications, different ideas, what, um, what we have been doing so far, that what, what's that set in motion. Um, we, at the moment, right now, we are, so we're developing a technology that can also, uh, for example, remotely detect uh, your heart sound. And it can, so it can detect your heart sound, and, and it's based on, on very similar concepts, uh, but it can do so with incredible detail. And again, the, the point here is to monitor over time very subtle changes and variations, which can be indications of, um, of, of, uh, of certain diseases. But uh, we can also use it, uh, for example, for biometric identification. Uh, each heart sound is uh, unique, a bit like a fingerprint, and this can be used to, to identify people. Uh, another direction in which we're going is uh, currently we have a project with the deaf blind community. And the idea is to use, so I'm coming back to the, the, the idea of the bat sense now. And the idea is to use this bat sensing technology combined with some haptics that's a wearable, at the moment we're looking at a hat, a wearable device. So completely unobtrusive, um, it doesn't look weird. It's something that, you know, it's a hat that, that the, the deaf blind person can, can wear. But what it gives them is sort of an augmented, um, 
sensation of, of their surroundings. So they'll still have their, their guide dog, for example, with them, but now they will be able to tell uh, where people are standing, how many people are there, how far away they are. And um, the feedback we've been having so far from, from that community is extremely, extremely positive. So these are just a, a few ideas to give sort of a, a sense of, uh, of where we're going, but we do believe this technology and, and related ideas um, hopefully will have a huge impact on the way we live uh, in the near future. Thank you. Um, Alex, as, a, as an entrepreneur, I said I was going to ask the last question, but let me ask another question while we uh, see whether any Q&A comes from the audience. Alex, as an entrepreneur, what are the VCs and angel investors saying about the potential of this kind of technology? Have you, have you had any feedback? Uh, we've, we've had quite, quite a few interests from, from different VCs and even companies uh, on, the, on the technology. Uh, the question is to find the, the right market and the right application. And we are currently working on this also with, with, with Daniele mm. towards developing the appropriate application based on this technology that could uh, reach the market. There are many different opportunities in terms of surveillance, in terms of health monitoring, also for monitoring what's going on inside a cabin, like a car or a public transport place. So there are, there are definitely different opportunities that we are exploring in this area. Mm. And uh, no steer on sort of which which of those seems most likely at this point and sort of the nearer term? The next steps we, we are having now. Yeah. No, I'm saying which of those areas, there's so many areas, right? So is, yeah. was there any steer from the investment community on which of those seems most likely? Um, or so what, sort of one, of the, one of the ones that seems more promising is in smart homes. Awesome. Can, we, can we ever try to implement this technology in the smart homes and can we help to monitor, as Daniel was saying, to monitor the, for instance, the health status of someone. We can also possibly track when an elderly person falls down in, in their toilet, for instance, when they are going to have a shower. There's a position or this is a place where you would never have a camera to monitor your, your grandma or your grandpa, right? But you can have these type of sensors that will give you lots of information of what's going on. So these are some of the applications that we are, that we are having in mind. And then um, for both of you, um, what do you worry about? You know, what, what keeps you up at night with this kind of work? Who wants to start? <laughs> um, I th one of the, I think one of the main points is the perception from the public um, and acceptance of new technology. We have seen time and time again, uh, new technologies come in and um, creating um, various reactions from the public. Some people might like them, um, some might be very suspicious, and, and, and that's natural. I and mean, if it's something you don't understand or something that's new, I think uh, it needs to be approached uh, very carefully. And of course, when you're talking about um monitoring over long times and you're talking about intelligent homes um I, lots of um scenarios sort of can come to mind and i think we need to be very careful in addressing those concerns and making sure that at no given time that the technology oversteps uh, its actual uh, intended purpose and and you can do that i mean there, there's I think the nice thing about this technology is, is that it's quite robust. It, it, so for example, people are trying to do similar things with webcams and they say, yeah, but we, we blur out the faces and, and we're not really imaging. But you know, it, it, it's a hard sell because actually you are imaging, you do have a camera and if you're blurring a face, well, maybe you can unblur it and, and, and you've got all kinds of data privacy, uh, privacy issues. Uh, but in this case, I mean, we have none of that. I mean, these are just data streams. Um, they're not images. They're data streams that are going to a computer. They're being interpreted by, by an AI, but at no point are they actually taking uh, images or recordings of you. So in that sense, I think, I think that's quite robust. But still, I mean, I can understand there can be anxiety and questions. And, and these are things that I think are sort of the, the questions that we need to answer and need to be careful of. Mm. 
That's helpful. Um, I see a question here from Elaine Taylor, specifically about the deaf-blind example you used. So how does the use of this technology impact on the dogs? Mm. So if you're using high frequency sounds? Yeah, so we need to be careful. Good question. <laughs> Uh, so at the moment, we're not planning on using uh, ultrasound um, for the deafblind. We actually have a radar sensor. I mean, these, these devices can be made tiny. So the idea really is that these will be, uh, I mean, they could, they could even be built into a button. I mean, it could be very obtrusive, very small, but using radar. So in this, this wavelength region, um, animals uh, are not sensitive to, to that. Um, when using ultrasound, um, we do need to, I mean, so for example, you know, we have Alexa devices and uh, in our homes, uh, they do have microphones um, and speakers. That could be an area where one might might look at ultrasound alternatives to this, but then, yeah, we need to, we, we need to think about uh, how pets will perceive or not um, this technology. It's a good mm. point. Thank you. And, and sort of in a related question, um, when you were speaking about the sort of heartbeat signature, I was also wondering sort of how much quiet do you need or does it depend on the wavelength that you use and sort of which ones will have interference and which ones won't? Ah, so the interesting thing here is that for the heartbeat, we've gone back to using light. Ah, so what we're okay. doing is we're picking up. So every time your heart beats, um, your skin vibrates. I mean, you can't really feel it. I mean, if you, if you go to the right position on your neck, you, you can sort of feel the dum. But we're we're picking up a lot more than that. We're picking up the sort of very fine vibrations. A bit. It's a bit like um, you know when you're shoving water through a tube. The tube will vibrate a bit. And and the same thing is happening here. Now your arteries are quite deeply embedded into your um, into your neck but still the vibrations propagate outwards and using a laser um, that is just illuminating your, your skin, your neck area, um, we, can, we can pick these, these vibrations up. So that, again, again, this would be at wavelengths that aren't visible to the eye with very low powers. Uh, and so that, that wouldn't require any, any form of quietness. And, yeah, mm. can, you know, so interesting. So with all of these use cases, you have this intersection of the sort of appropriate sensor, the appropriate wa wavelength, the appropriate algorithm, the appropriate sort of, um, yeah. you know, privacy protections. It's, it's, it's quite a sort of, it's almost like a principles based approach to this technology and then actually swapping out the specifics. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. Right. Is, yeah, it's a principle of the of the bat sense, if you want. Yeah, and, then, and that's precisely what we've been thinking about. You know, as I said, we started off from lasers, looking around corners, but the, the concept always was, you know, it's picking up these echoes. What can I do with them? And it, and then you know, in a sense, that frees that frees you up, frees it frees your mind up in terms of the technology you want to use, because then you, know, you start to discover that you can pick up echoes over across a whole spectrum of technology. Yeah. So your team's about to get more and more multidisciplinary, I would guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're going to be in the in the in the sort of field of echoes as opposed it's to like um, anyone. anyone. I like that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, there's a question here from Sasha on which probably would be specific to the different wavelengths, but an indication of the costs of these kinds of remote sensing technologies. So maybe a feeling for how expensive the sensors are, how expensive the sort of data streaming collection, how expensive the um, sort of algorithm building, like, like what so do you know the, about, about the costs? The nice thing of all these technologies is that we are using existing technology. It's not nothing that we are developing on our own. We are using off the shelf devices. So if you just think of microphones, there are microphones everywhere, right? Uh, and, and even in our cars, we have ultrasound sensors that allow us to park. We also do have in our cars uh, radar sensors, and we have Wi-Fi antennas in our Wi-Fi routers at home in our in our cell phones. So this is really technology that is off the shelf that we are that we are starting to use, and it's new for us. But the technology is being is being there and it's being currently used. So we are talking about in terms of the hardware, it's just few dollars. It, it it's really cheap in terms of the of the algorithms. And how we process the data, uh, you know that now many of the of these different applications can be performed in the cloud. So this would free part of the resources and speed of the of the algorithms. We can also embed this, and, and with Daniele we are we are working on embedding all these algorithms 
in microprocessors, right? Which these microprocessors are much smaller, they are more power efficient, they are compact, and they are also very cheap. So we are always talking of technology that it's really on um, few dollars, maybe tens of dollars. It's really, really cheap, cheap technology. Mm. I love that when things are built with existing uh, components, you can go a really mm -hmm. long way quite quickly, can't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, so I don't know whether the audience has any more questions, but um, feel free to put them in if you do. One of the things um, I was thinking about is just, you know, you, what you've really managed to do is sort of change my view on, on echoes. And right? I think I'd always thought of them as a binary. You know, there is an echo, there isn't an echo. And I think this sort of multi-path, um, you've really sort of opened my eyes and I guess my ears um, to the idea that it could, you know, bounce, these things bounce off all sorts of different surfaces in different ways. Um, that's just, it's, it's something really different that I hadn't considered. Now, were you yeah. hoping yeah. to say anything else about your work? Is there anything you'd like to encourage the audience to, to look out for? Um, I think you summarized it very nicely uh, earlier on with your comment that we're sort of doing echo science. And, and you're right, I mean, this, all this work and thinking about echoes has led us to think very differently about what echoes mean. And, you know, I, it's always been fun as a kid to find places that echo. And sometimes you find these arches where you can hear uh, multiple echoes. And um, it, it's fun, but it's it's really intriguing to see that actually it's, it goes a lot further than that. It's fascinating, it's useful, and could potentially uh, change our lives in the near future. And I think that's, that's the interesting sort of take home message to take away. Mm. Thank you. And Alex, did you want to have a last word? So just going back to the to the idea of echoes and why we find it so so fascinating and related to our work, it's just because I was reading a, a physiology book and apparently we as humans, we cut in terms of how much time do we wait to hear the next sound in our brain. It's cut for a few milliseconds. So if you, if you talk yourself and then you wait for your own voice or others' voices to, to go back to your to your ear. There is basically a cutoff. And after this cutoff, we can't hear. So our process, our brain can't process more data. And, and that's why we aren't generally used to this form of very extended and multipath echoes. And this is precisely what using hardware and, and this technology allow us, right? We are, we are not using animal brains anymore. We are using brains that are artificial through our algorithms. And these allow us to hear longer and these allow us to extract much more information. And as Daniel was saying, uh, these allow us for a, probably for a, for a brighter future in terms of how we can use all this information, what applications can we find from all this, and, and so on. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, sorry, couldn't resist. Thank you, Christina. Um, thank you, Daniele. Thank you, Alex. Um, I had no idea there were so many implications from this. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. Nice telling you. <laughs> well, good. Well, so we are headed into a break now. Uh, the next session starts at 6 p.m. I do recommend you come back. It's called A Thousand Brains. It's with Azim Azar and Jeff Hawkins, and it should be a really good one. Um, in the meantime, there's still networking. There's all sorts of things to explore on the platform. So please do that. See you in a bit.